Welcome to the Foundation's The Business Program. I'm Lori Hamill. Uh, before we get uh, to our guest today, I want to let you know that the Foundation has set up a COVID relief fund in order to support the thousands of union performers who are going through tough times. Since March of 2020, thanks to your donations, the Foundation has given over $6.3 million in emergency aid to more than 6,800 performers and their families. If you are a SAG AFTER member, and you need help, please ask. And if you can help, please give. You can find out more information about it in the details below this video. Thank you for your support. All right, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists. We have Brandon Kyle Goodman, Shalita Grant, Rebecca LaMarche, Tyler Dean Flores, and Ronan Rubenstein. Welcome everybody. Hey, uh, hello. <laughs> So good to have you here. Uh, so let's just get started. Um, first of all, because this is a program for actors, it would be lovely to hear, how did you know that you wanted to be an actor? And uh, Shalita, do you want to start us off? <laughs> um, well, I actually, um, there wasn't a, a moment, but um, I, I'm from Virginia. I was born in Baltimore. I was raised in Virginia. And um, <laughs> I had a, an interesting upbringing, um, teen parents. Um, and when it came down for high school, uh, when I was in Virginia, I was like, well, I know everybody at Petersburg High School. So there was a sleepy meeting for a new um, governor school that they were opening. And it was for arts. And I was like, well, I think I'm going to go to the art school. And because I didn't study like music or dance or anything like that, I was like, I think I'm going to do acting. So I did a monologue from, I actually did a scene from A Raven in the Sun. My mom was like, you should do the scene. And I did mm -hmm. Mama and Benita scene where Benita says she doesn't believe in God and Mama slaps her. And I slapped myself and they got me into the school. <laughs> and yes. from there, um, I ended up going to Baltimore School for the Arts. Eventually I moved. And uh, in my senior year, I had an acting teacher that asked me if I wanted to go to college. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, well, you should think about the Juilliard school. And I was like, what's that? And he was like, it's a good school. You should audition. And I auditioned and they gave me a full scholarship, which was why I went. Wow. And it was there that I realized like, what I had done at 17. So from Juilliard was when I was pretty set that this was the career path for me. Love it. Thank you. Rebecca? Uh, I didn't want to want to be an actor. The idea of it really scared me. <laughs> I had also always just been so interested in just about every other career I could think of. And even now, sometimes I'm like, oh, wow, like maybe I want to do this. And I think that that's kind of how I fell in love with acting because it's that curiosity and wanting to throw yourself into a million different things that made it so exciting for me. So the more I kind of tried to resist the urge, the more I felt excited when I was working. And then eventually I just kind of gave in to it and fully focused all my energies on it. Great. Brandon? Um, uh, my grandmother was a minister and my mother is an actress. So I kind of grew up with performers in the house. And then when I was in eighth grade, my teacher, my English teacher, Miss Robbins, decided we were gonna do a spoof of Romeo and Juliet. And she cast me as Laura Miel. And I was like, yes, this is beautiful. I love this. And then that's, here we are. <laughs> Fabulous. Ronan? Yeah, in high school, I, I didn't, um, I, I'd never even thought of acting or performing. Um, I wasn't a very good kid. I messed around a lot and, and got in a lot of trouble and hung out with sort of the wrong crews. and. Um, it was a, a guidance counselor of mine. Uh, it was my junior year of high school. And she straight up told me, she's like, listen, you know, I, I think you're on a really bad path. And I think um, as cliche as it might sound like theater might actually be a good option for you. Um, and I was, you know, I was so against it. And uh, I remember I auditioned for, it was like the school play that summer. And, um, I did it. And then, you know, once, once 
I started getting into the whole flow of like, you know, rehearsing and, and being held accountable and, and having, you know, some sort of responsibility and, and, and also discipline. Um, it took me away from, you know, getting in trouble and it, it let me be fully focused on something. Um, and it let me be creative and, and I found that so therapeutic and, uh, once, once we did the play and seeing people's reaction and hearing people laugh and clap and, and, and feeling the overall energy in the theater, um, I, I literally caught the bug like that night. And I was like, this is what I want to do. Um, and I've been obsessed ever since. And uh, yeah. Wow. That's so interesting to hear too, how that specific person really shifted for you a whole trajectory of how things would just continue to have momentum that that's yeah thank you thanks for letting us know yeah, sure. Tyler so I never wanted to be an actor growing up <laughs> at all I remember doing a play in like fourth grade and catching like a nervous attack on stage and running off so that was never in my plan ever um but I've always wanted to find some way to like provide for myself and for my family um, so I would try to find these little things to make money when I'm like nine, 10 years old. So I got myself into modeling. Um, and then my agency had a TV agency and they recommended me to get into acting, which I told them no, but they just kept pressing and pressing. Um, so I went to an acting class and I was around like 12 years old. And then a year into acting, I landed the dark Knight rises, um, which was my first project ever, my first job ever. And that kind of, I guess, made me realize that I should be doing this. <laughs> and that was it. It's been on since. That's fabulous. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's interesting as actors when you find out, oh, this is my path. I'd like to know, did you have any uh, reaction from your friends and family when you decided it? And, and whoever would like to jump in, please do. Like, what was it like when you said, I want to do this? how was it around you with friends and family? Were they supportive? Um, this, what, what did they say? My mother was against it, ironically, the actress. She was like, no, I don't want you doing that. Cause you know, obviously it's a, it's a really challenging life. And she was doing it impressively with, by herself with a child, which is just like, wow. Um, but then she thought about it and was kind of like, you know, people usually, a lot of times follow in the footsteps of their parents and work. And so when she saw it from that angle and saw that she could maybe shepherd me and mentor me, then she kind of changed her tune. But at first she was not about it. She was like, why do you want to do that? That's a struggle, mm -hmm. girl. <laughs> Have you ever acted with your mom? No, but we should, because she's yeah. ferocious. <laughs> she's wild, but no, we've never, never acted together. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, I'll, I'll go. Um, it was definitely a roller coaster. Um, my parents are from the Soviet Union. So for them, anything in the performing arts was like a fairy tale. And it wasn't, sometimes it wasn't even allowed. Um, you know, they're very, very by the book. Like you have to get a degree and you have to get a profession, you know, whether doctor, lawyer, uh, professor, um, that's sort of the only options that they knew. So they sort of try to instill that onto me. Um, <laughs> so when I came to them and I was like, I'm going to be an actor, they're like, no way. Like, absolutely <laughs> not. like they shut that down really quick. And I, you know, I, I sort of have to be grateful for my personal like stubbornness, I think. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, early on, it, n most of the time, nobody's going to believe in you. And I hear that all the time. It's like, you believe in yourself first and then people start coming along. Um, but it really, ha you really have to like, you know, stick with it. Um, Cause you're not going to get much support or at least not a lot of the time, you're not going to get a lot of support in the beginning. Um, you know, and even when things started happening, um, it was like, it was back and forth. It was like, Oh yeah, this might be a thing. It might be a, a career choice. And then, you know, once, you know, you don't work for eight, months 12 months then they're like see i told you this is not a realistic career so it's a lot of going back and forth and i don't think it was until like i don't know 
2016 when my parents were like fully on board um and that's probably because of, of of my first show and you know finally they saw that there's some you know actual way to to support myself um but it was it was it was hard to get through to them um and uh yeah now 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 i always tell them like i told you guys <laughs> <laughs> should have made it a little easier for me back then yeah it's interesting though you had that uh, really strong feeling and that you kept going and and uh, also that stubbornness that actually got you through that persistence that that, that kept you going yeah Very interesting it's a scary place to be in you know it's super scary sure. it's a big risk yeah, you, I mean you really got to believe in yourself it's it's such a cliche saying but I mean it's true absolutely Shalita do you want to talk about how your family and friends reacted Oh, yeah, that's why I didn't say anything, because um, <laughs> honestly, Lori, listen, um, the bar <laughs> was very low for me from the very beginning. Um, like my my parents were, were teen parents. They did what they wanted to. My grandmother was a teen mom, my great grandmother I knew. So like I grew up, it was bananas in Virginia. So I think because like my grandma's, my grandma had seven kids. Um, I'm the oldest of nine. So there's so many people that because of that, from a very young age, I learned that I had to be self-guided. So I never really checked in with anyone about what I was doing. Um, because if I was able to provide for myself and like make it happen, I didn't feel the need to involve other people. Um, in my decision making. And that way, I've always been a little wild. So this is, um, it makes sense that this was the first career for me. <laughs> Acting, you know, being everywhere and, and not really feeling like, um, I like a desk job, like, we're always doing something different, you know, and that is actually more my vibe. Um, oh, yeah. Interesting. And when you were at Juilliard, did that sort of say to them, oh, she's she's on her path because you had left Virginia to be? Oh, my there. God. I left, I left Virginia when I was 15. So, um, yeah, I left Virginia when I was 15. I moved in with my dad's family. Um, my dad, uh, he... He was the golden child. My grandma had polio. So um, she didn't think she could have a child. And so when she was my age, 32, she had my dad and whatever he wanted, she gave him. And one day he walked in at 12 years old in the sixth grade and was like, I don't want to go to school anymore. And she was like, okay. Um, so when I moved in with him, when I was 15, I was also a bit of a wild child, even at the governor's school. My mom was like, you need to go live with your dad's family. I moved in with him and he was like, do you even want to go to school? And I was like, yeah, actually, I think I should. Um, <laughs> so I had the campaign actually to um, get him to take me to Baltimore School for the Arts. And we showed up on like a regular Wednesday and was like, can I audition? I know I'm too old and this isn't your audition period, but I could read really early, which was one of my saving graces. Um, but I was like, I have extenuating circumstances. I'm coming from a different state. So can I audition? And he was like, yeah, come back next week and we'll, we'll do it proper. And I got into that school. Um, and yeah, a year and a half later, you know, I was having the Juilliard conversation. So I've just kind of had to like fend for myself because you know, everybody, the way I grew up, they were, everyone was every man for himself. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to jump in talking about uh, friends and family reactions? Um, my parents were always very supportive. Um, if I want to quit right now, they would support that, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you definitely need a lot of believing in yourself. Like Ronan said, um, that's the most important part um, because there's times where you don't even work, you know, for, for a long time. And you just need to keep believing in yourself and just keep going. Cause once you lose or once you stop, that's when you lose. If you don't stop and you just keep going, you win. Excellent. Rebecca. Yeah. I, I mean, I was 
I'm really lucky. My family's always been very supportive. Um, my parents, my siblings, my boyfriend, I've been really lucky. But what was interesting is they, they didn't stop being supportive, but they really, really gave me some push when I wasn't having fun with it early on, when I just felt so lost and spinning my wheels and not even sure what I was doing or if I was making the right choices. And I think I was kind of burying myself with my own pressure that no one else was putting on me. Mm -hmm. And when they saw that, they really pushed a lot. Like, are you sure you want to do this? Um, more so my dad, um, how are you going to be self-reliant? How are you going to make a future? All those conversations, but like daily, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like daily. Um, but then as soon as I kind of, you know, got my head back on straight and figured it out for myself, as soon as I was having fun with it again, or feeling happy or confident or just in a really good mental health headspace, completely supportive. Um, and I think that for me, at least makes all the world difference. Absolutely. And I'd like to get more into that as we go along today, a little bit about how you keep yourself resilient, everybody. Um, but um, I'm just wondering, just kind of jumping into today, how do you know if a project's right for you? Because, you know, you, uh, we've heard stories now about people, you know, as, as uh, actors having to push forward no matter what anybody said. How do you use that same sort of internal knowing to uh, approach roles now? I'd love to hear about that because it sounds as though everyone has a, there's something that's driving you and and keeping you on your path what is it for you um what is the criteria how do you just trust your gut on roles that come up i mean for me you know i'm black and i'm queer and a lot of the roles are trash right it's a lot of surface 2d hey girl how big is this dick kind of energy and mm -hmm. so i'm very clear like that if that's what it is i can't do it mm -hmm. you know it has to be yeah, there has to be a connection, even if it's like two lines, it's like, I don't want to, how do I say this? Um, you're representing your people, you know, you're representing your community and there are so many roles out there that don't do us justice. And so it's really important that whatever role it is, that most importantly, it's not going to tarnish black people, queer people, it's not gonna tarnish black queer people. Um, and that it's actually gonna elevate and push us forward, push the representation forward. Um, if it's just to service a white protagonist and kind of be like funny because I'm sassy, then it's like, oh, I'm not here for that, you know? And I think what you say no to is actually even more important than what you say yes to. Like having to trust that, you know, I'm gonna find another way to pay these bills, but like this, I can't do to myself. Um, or, or if I'm going to do it, I'm gonna make that choice knowingly. I'm going to go in with open eyes that I'm going to make this move strategically because I know there's something else that I'm trying to do. Um, does that make sense? Did I make yeah. any sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Okay. And, and also you're, you're working as a writer too. So do you bring mm -hmm. that same sensibility to the room with the characters that you create? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I bring a lot of my mm -hmm. personal experience and it's, you know, sometimes it's little things like we'll write, uh, you know, we have our main characters. Um, I wrote in the show Big Mouth. And so we have our main characters. Uh, but like sometimes they'll be in scenes with new characters. And it's as simple as me writing in my script that that character is black. They might not have any lines. They might just be there to say two things. But the idea that like one of the kids is now black is important. It's like important for us to see that. It's important to see a black or, or, or South Asian queer kid inside of that scene, even if it's three lines. So those are the things that are really important to me. So I definitely bring that to the table when we're, when we're fleshing stuff out. Wonderful. Anyone else wanna share about um, deciding how you take roles and what, what roles to take? Yes, actually, I'm, and I'm so grateful for everything that was just said. Um, absolutely. And um, for me, it's it was after graduating and um, going, like having the journey of being an actress, like I wasn't one of the ones that, you know, got a, a giant television show out of school. So my personal economy was always, um, you know, a 
forefront in my mind. And like all of us, um, I, I struggled with a scarcity mindset in that, mm. you know, I would look at every opportunity, especially in the beginning of my career, like it was the one, even mm. if even at my, like in my early twenties, when I didn't know as much about myself as I do now, there were things that I would read that would pop up for me as red flags that I would push down because I thought, who am I to uh, decide? Who am mm. I to, um, you know, because I was in the habit of pedestaling my career, pedestaling, you know, the, the, the life of a successful actor. And as I went through my career, um, I had a few jobs that were so painful in mm. that they were so not a right energetic match even though I could do drama, even though I can do a procedural, doesn't necessarily mean that that's what I should be doing. And mm -hmm. when I was making the money and like having the conversations about how deeply unhappy I was, you know, the thing that would come up, especially from other actors is, hey, but it's, it's network money. It's, it's you know, got to think about, you know, when you didn't have a job. And when I had the courage to put my heart first, one of the biggest uh, takeaways for me, and I was privileged in the sense that I could make this decision now because I did have the money and I did have the wherewithal about my economy that I was like, oh, this is how I need to start approaching because I was a grown woman in the sense that baby had bills and <laughs> bought a house. So, so it was like, how can I make sure that I take care of the woman, but also take care of the soul? And mm. for me, my going through that tough, you know, three years, you learn or you lose. And for me, I was like, I'm going to learn. I'm going to let this pain teach me what my boundaries are. And when I came out of that, what I learned was I just need to be making people laugh because it makes me happy. And, mm -hmm. and I also need things. And you know what? <laughs> if I can't get them, thank you. I will wait for my vibe, my, my tribe. To, to come to me and I'll trust that I have enough goodwill, enough skill, enough experience that if it's not in front of me, I'm supposed to be learning something in its stead. Because that was also one of the biggest things um, when I was, when I went from a Tony nominee to a Tony nominated bartender in LA, uh, <laughs> that was a painful ego lesson. Um, in that period, what was I learning? I was learning that you can't, you can't be focused on the thing. You got to get a life because we're yeah. actors. So if my whole e energy is absorbed toward booking, 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 my energy is so trash in the room and mm. I crash on the couch and, and I, I go into my histrionics. I love a good robe too when I'm sad. Uh, I, I, I really invested in my, I mean, listen, I can talk about rejection till the cows come home. I really learned a lot. I've been taking myself through it, but I would celebrate the sadness because I yes. learned that it's important to me. That's why I'm sad. So I would, I, I would start, uh, my first year in LA after being a Tony nominated actress from 2013, 2014, I got my first job in LA. I, when I got that job, that job was a recurring guest star. It was two episodes, didn't change my life. And they, they canceled the show. Um, in that year, right? I went through so much pain, yo. Like I was so different. And I went to my email and I counted how many projects I had been rejected from because I knew mm. I had tested five times to get this recurring guest star. I had tested for five different shows, but I didn't know how much of my energy I had, I had expended and how many times I got back up after saying no. Like I needed hey. to know why I was so tired. And I realized that I had auditioned for 59 different projects. That's not how many auditions 
That was projects. Some things you go in six times, you sign a contract and you go in your imagination, which is very powerful. It's how I got to where I am. I would go into my imagination and I would be buying things and I would be having this different lifestyle. And then I would go in and they'd be like, not her. And I'd be like, oh, in my Prius seat, no. <laughs> so what I learned in that was that I had to take my eye off of the ball because mm. that's where the magic was. It's not in the audition room. It's everything I was doing outside of it. So what I do now is I follow my bliss. If a project literally excites me, I've saved enough that I can wait for those. So that's what I do. Love it. Thank you. Testimony. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and a philosophy. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Tyler, do you want to share how you go ahead and um, decide if something's right for you? For sure. I don't even know I'm going to follow that up, but <laughs> <laughs> I definitely, I agree with Shalita. Um, I definitely respect myself. And if there's, you know, a project that I just find fun um, and I feel like it can move me forward, then I take it. Um, but I am very, very picky with my stuff because like Shalita said as well, you just kind of, you live your life. So I go on and live my life and, you know, hang out with my friends, family, do other things. And then I come back and peek in on what auditions I have. And maybe sometimes I'm just like, I'm not feeling this. I'm not connecting to this character, passing, continue looking forward. And then with those that I actually do like, I just take the time and really spend a lot of time with that character and, and put it on tape and, submit it and see what happens. But that's pretty much my process. Um, I don't really accept anything and everything. Um, because once you do that, it's kind of like, like Shalita said, you got to take your eye off that, off that ball sometimes and just live your life. And once you do that, things just start happening for you. Um, for sure. And thank you, Tyler. And as far as the project coming up, that's coming out this month, Rifa, your, the film, um, how did that happen? Did, did you know the creators of that ahead of time? How did that fall into place for you? Yes. So I had a mutual friend with the director and writer. Her name is Jessica. And my mutual friend just told me like, hey, I think you're going to be great for this project. Check it out. And I read it and I really connected with the character. Um, I felt like both of our purposes were very, very similar. Um, so I met the director, then I put it on tape and then I got hired for the job. Rebecca, do you wanna talk about your process of uh, deciding about roles that come up? Yeah, I think it's, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of the same stuff coming up between all of us. It's uh, really, will I be happy doing the work is the biggest one. If not, you know, ask yourself why. But the one thing that, um, that I'll say to my agents is, I don't feel like this character serves me. Um, and it's a way to look at it. Does the character serve you in, in whatever that might mean in your career and your happiness um, or what the, the kind of job it is, what the working conditions are. Um, so that's something that's conversation we'll have sometimes. But the other thing that I've kind of made for me is I never want to feel like I'm just like a meat prop. <laughs> I had one early experience where I went in for a comedy. I thought the part was hilarious. I went into that audition. I felt so confident, um, got it that day, went into the audition on my drive home, booked the part. It seemed, everything seemed right. And then I got on set and um, it was like, like nothing horrible happened to me. It was a horrible experience though. Like I just felt like a meat prop and not, not valued. So I learned that pretty early and um, am just more cautious about what parts I'm going out for and what I'm taking and if it serves me and if it makes me happy. And I think that you have to make sure that you're set up financially at any stage in your career so that you don't feel like you have to take that quote network money or you don't have to take anything thrown your way because you're not dependent on it. And, and it's really empowering. And I think that that comes with you when you go to audition or read or test or anything like that. Wonderful. Thank you. Ronan. I think for me personally, I think it varied, you know, in the beginning, you sort of take whatever you could get. Um, most of the time it's complete dog shit. And I sort of had to put myself in a, in a mind frame of 
how do you approach the work, right? Like, you know, it's probably going to be pretty awful, right? Like sometimes the scripts are just, just, just shit. And, and, you know, I sort of, I got to a place where I'm like, okay, if, if I treat this film as if, you know, it's a, a Fincher film or a Christopher Nolan film and sort of come in with, you know, that sort of attitude and, and preparation, then I, it should set me up for when, you know, I'm actually on a decent set with a decent, you know, production and, and director. So I sort of, I had to get myself into that mind frame early on. And then slowly as things started happening, um, you know, it, it became easier to approach the work that way, you know, because the actual work sort of um, matched my attitude and, and, and the reward was was much better. Um, and, you know, things started, you know, coming out and people actually started seeing it. And, you know, you actually started finally getting some sort of response, you know, and 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 actually, you know, have work that people respect and, and enjoy. Um, so I'm glad that I sort of had that mind frame early on when the work was awful. <laughs> so, you know, now, so leading into sort of the past few years, you know, I've been very fortunate. I've, I'm, I'm on a gigantic show that's like, I still have a hard time wrapping my head around how I got there and what it is. Cause it's like, a, it's a, it's a fucking machine. Um, and you know, it, now you start thinking about other things. It's like, you know, it's like, what, 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 how do you sort of balance the work and then outside of work? And, you know, now I, I sort of don't have to think about the next job, which I'm very grateful for, but then it's also like, how do you stay, you know, sharp and stay fresh and stay hungry uh, while being on something like this. And uh, that that's become a whole new sort of challenge. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just sort of adapting to your environment. Um, and, you know, I, I've sort of, my whole career, my, my happy place is set. So that's one thing that I've been able to maintain throughout. Um, whether, you know, you're making $60 a day or, you know, something much better. <laughs> Um, I, I've always been happy to be on set with, with crews and, and, and you, you meet the most random people in the world from all over the world. And you meet, you know, super creative people. And it, that's always been my happy place. So I sort of have always enjoyed the process. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it definitely changes. I think it just like everything, it evolves. I think as, as people we evolve. And I think as, as, as actors, we evolve and as, as, as business people in this industry, we evolve. And that's sort of my, my, my journey. When TK. Sorry, so much. Oh, it's great. It's great. <laughs> when, when the character of TK first came up, were you like, this is me? I mean, did, or, or what, what was your feeling about it? Because it's obviously something that's changed your life. Um, how was that when you first were introduced to the idea of playing TK? I can't, I can't put it into words. It's sort of um, all the pieces were just too good to be true. You know, um, mm -hmm. aside from like the actual, the character I adore and, and he's in so many ways. So, so uncomfortably similar to what I went through um, and, and what I'm going through now. Um, so that was very weird. Like when life imitates art, so that was very bizarre to sort of wrap my head around. And, you know, it, it definitely gave me a lot of stuff to pull from, but it's, you know, at times it's, you're pulling from, you know, a very unsettling time in your life. So, so that was, that was very strange, but then, you know, it's like having that mentality of like, am I even worthy of being here, you know, and do I even deserve this? And, and, and have they made a mistake or, you know, am I going to mess up or am I going to, you know, you, you, I think the first season I had this God awful feeling that I would get a call every week and be like, sorry, we're going to have to recast you. You're just not the guy, you know? And, and that is a fucking scary feeling to have. And I think, you know, later on, I became much more comfortable with that, but it's, yeah, you know, I, I was, 
so excited, obviously, but there's a lot of nerves, a lot of nerves and a lot of sort of um, hesitation. And, you know, you want to make these people proud, you know, like when you got Ryan Murphy and 20th century hovering over you, you're like, I need to make these people proud, you know? So that was always a bit terrifying. It's still terrifying, but um, I, I think I've just adapted a little better to it now. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. So looking at now, you know, where you are now and, and going back to that person who is deciding whether or not to go on this path, is there anything that you wish you would have told that younger self? And of course, by saying that, something that would help other actors who are um, watching and listening right now. I think it's what Shalita said, which is that like, find your bliss. You know, I think that this journey, uh, I've been working for three years, right? So it's very new to like have any kind of stability. Um, before I'm 34, so it's been since I was 14 to 31 when I started working. That's a long time to be up in this. Um, it's a spiritual journey. And I woke up maybe when I was 30 and I realized that I was in an abusive relationship with my career, that I put everything on my career. It was supposed to feed me, it was supposed to make me famous, it was supposed to give me power, it was supposed to buy me a house. All this stuff make me happy was the career and I was neglecting my entire life. I had just gotten engaged, we got a puppy, like moved to LA. And so it's like, you really have to remember this is a spiritual journey and it's not about the gig, it's about you. We're artists, right? At the end of the day, we are artists, not the actor, not that we're artists. So your life, you're gonna be a shitty actor if you don't have a life. If you don't have something to, that brings you joy, if you don't have experiences, if you don't get to move through, if everything is about the gig, you're gonna be shitty at it when you get it. So the best thing that you can do is go have a life, go have fun. What are other hobbies? Do things that are not related to it so that you show up as a full person and then you can bring your full self to that role and then it'll fit. But it's when you try to be something for everybody else when you try to make it work for everybody else, you try to make the whole, make the career your identity. It cannot be your identity. You are more than your career. If that's anything I would say yes. to my younger self is you are more than your career. You are funnier, sweeter, kinder, lovelier. You are more interesting than your career. Go be a person. And then the career will come and it'll be satisfying because you've lived that life and you know what's good for you, you know what you want, you know what you don't want, then the career can really fit to you as opposed to the career running you. Who wants that life? No, yeah. I. Absolutely. Beautiful, thank you. I know when, when you say like be a person, because I find if you just narrow yourself into I'm an actor, I'm an actor, that's, that's the only box you put yourself in. How can you be a relatable person in your work? Like you have mm. nothing real to go off of. Right. So I think that like beyond the joy of that, that's even just like kind of service your work as an artist because it's, it's the work of humanity. And if you're not exploring your humanity, you can't explore it on screen. Right. A thousand percent. Yeah, I learned early on to not be a martyr. And I forgot who told me that, but that changed everything for me. And it's so true, man. You like if you look at it from a huge scale, it's like how much time, you know, you're auditioning or, you know, even on set compared to your actual real life, it's like mm. life outweighs tremendously, you know? So it's like, are you gonna spend your actual real life focusing and stressing and, you know, sometimes hating yourself about this little, you know, blimp in your overall life? It's, it, it, it's, it's gonna be a waste, you know? You're gonna look back when you're old and you're gonna be like, fuck, what did I do? You know? So yeah. I, yeah, I totally echo all of that. That's so true. To kind of piggyback off of that as well. Um, starting young helped me a lot too, because when I was younger, I was very clueless about everything. Mm -hmm. Like being on the dark Knight rises set and working with Christopher Nolan, I would call him Chris and like, <laughs> wasn't even nervous. And, you know, just like, I just went about it like that. So being able to tap back into that now, years later and still kind of have that clueless energy and just live your life and tap back into these jobs have helped me tremendously. 
Can I share an unpopular opinion? Like really unpopular. Go ahead. <laughs> Get it. I Bring it on, Rebecca. Really think that um, like not intentionally, but I really think most acting coaches are trash. Like I think that they do <laughs> so much damage and they put so many people years behind. Like I will see people go into a class and come out like four years backwards. Mm -hmm. And I think we've all had those experiences where we subscribe to these gurus who are telling you how to do your work, how to live your life, how to make your decisions about your art. And it just makes you so wooden and bad <laughs> and you're paying a lot of money. So I think, I think the biggest thing is if some method doesn't, you know, subscribe to you or feel real or resonate with you, just get the hell out of there. Rebecca, I'm so glad that you chose to be brave and go <laughs> because I'm sitting here. Okay, I'm gonna reference Real Housewives for balance. Um, yes. <laughs> there is this, this iconic Gia Giudice moment where she's singing and she's like waking up in the morning thinking about so many things and you're like what would I tell my younger self there are so many things I needed to tell my younger self and Rebecca honestly you put it perfectly what I heard and what I would tell younger Shalita is to look within mm. at any time you have the impulse to find the answer outside of you look within because mm. that's where it's at you know, anything that I thought I could have given or, or received from someone else, be it love, belonging, um, acceptance, um, to be heard, to feel seen. I, I had to come to Jesus after a relationship that, you know, I was invested in in that way. And my takeaway was I need to be what I needed. Mm. I need to be what I need. Anytime I'm reaching out because I, oh, I think I need this from this person, or I think I need that, I could embody it and give it to myself. Mm. And if we want to talk acting, I got this from an actor in my younger self, but I wish I would have gotten it earlier. So I'm going to bless someone else with this. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I was doing a, a play in Boston and I had gotten word that a play that I had been with since it was a one act, uh, the producers were like, we don't know her. We don't want her. We're going to audition everyone <laughs> except for her. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't go well for them. And I got an email from uh, the playwright and he was like, hey, can you come down to New York? I know that you've workshopped this play. Um, it's not going well. Can you come down and show them what it is? And I was so upset and hurt. Like I had taken that rejection personally. I mm -hmm. had taken it to mean that they didn't believe that Shalita Grant mm -hmm. had worth. And it was hard because I had taken it that way. And um, an actor that I was working with at the time, Victor Williams, um, he was on, um, <laughs> he was on The King of Queens. He, um, and we were doing this uh, play together in Boston. And I loved him from that show, loved him so much that I made him think we knew each other. And he really believed we did. And he took his glasses off. And I was like, God damn it, Shalita, you did it again. You don't know this man. He is an actor on a show you watch but we became friends because of that and i'm in the car with him riding down and i'm like victor like i'm really having a hard time with this because i don't feel like i'm enough like if they saw what i was doing they would have picked me right and he was like try to look at it this way every audition is two things it's your opportunity to do what you love for the day and it's an opportunity to show them what you would do on your first day of rehearsal. Mm. And so with that preparation change, I had more control over my part of the experience, which was how I show up in the room. Mm. I don't wanna show up with resentment, with uh, insecurity, with inferiority, with 
you may reject me because you can feel that in some way. And even if you're not a sensitive human and can feel it, it will affect how I do in the room. Mm. And yeah, I walked out with my role. And that was the show that I was nominated for a Tony for my Broadway debut. I think what you bring up, Shalita, is rejection is not a reflection of your worth. And that's so important to know. You know, I think we get in our heads, we get into a prison because we feel like, as you said, it's a personal attack. And it's like, your worth is not in that job. You are fabulous as you are, you know? I think that's a really hard thing to remember. I love that. I love that. That's how you put it. I'm going to throw some more spin on it because it just came to me hearing it that way. Rejection is not a reflection of where you are at the time. It's mm. a reflection of where they are. Mm. Because yes. that's where they were. And they had to see everyone in New York City before they realized that it was me. So that was where they were. And then they came round. And I'm sure we all have some version of that story where a, re- a no became a yes. So mm-hmm. that's power, Brandon. Ooh, I'm glad yes. you're here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad y'all are here. <laughs> I'm glad you're all here. It's these, these are, this is just so great. And, and, you know, Shalita, I think too, it's like if you got into the space of, um, resentment around it that was part of your tra- trajectory to doing that wonderful show and then leading to the next the next the next and i was also just going to ask you when you um prepare for on camera how did that how was that shift for you from going from the theater to going to on camera for, for love the question, work? Lori. thank you so much for asking okay so the last year of juilliard this this is why i'm saying it was so many things we we had a real a class that was called the real world. Some of the things we went over in this class, open your mail. That was a legit lesson. Like actors, <laughs> you gotta open up your mail when you get out of the school, okay? Open your mail. Things happen in the mail. Um, and and she she said, like, you're gonna hit at different times. And you know, your career is not always a reflection of your talent, it's a reflection of your being as you are in that moment. Like there are roles that you just can't play at 20 that you get at 33, you know? Like, it's just, it is what it is. I wish I would have believed her. I was in the class the whole time with my notepad, like, she's wrong. She doesn't know what I'm about to do. She has no idea where the star is going. Wish I would have believed her would have caused me less pain. Um, In that class also though, uh, because Juilliard doesn't do like on camera, The reason is because it's all the same. So the thing that we were taught was bring your voice down, do less. Like it's literally the the camera is your only audience member. So when you're in a 800 uh, seater, you're bigger, your voice has to be bigger, your everything has to be bigger, but it's easier to do less than it is to try to do more, you know? because it's about skill and experience, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's bring your voice down and squint and pout. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Squint and pout, I love it. Um, Now I have, we have some questions that are coming in. We've just got a few minutes left and this has just been such a delightful conversation. Thank you all. Um, She, uh, let's see, Remy was telling me, we don't, we haven't received a lot of questions. But here's a good one. We'd love to hear from everyone whether they still face imposter syndrome and how you deal with it. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Want to tackle that one? Oh, my God. Yes. I was talking to my therapist this morning about it. I was like, I just read this thing about imposter syndrome, and I feel it every day. Mm -hmm. Um, That's why I keep saying this thing is a spiritual journey, because what happens, what I realize is because you're rejected so many times, when you get the yes, which is so rarely... Uh, you're like, oh, this is wrong. Something has to be wrong because I'm used to the rejection uh, over and over again. Mm -hmm. And so it really is important that you have, to me, affirmations. You have your kind of spirit game, correct? I'm not talking about your religious game, but just like your gratitude game. Like I'm grateful for this, for this, your affirmations. I am worthy. I am enough. So that you can start to reprogram yourself because if you're just taking rejection without reprogramming it, is that 
rejection is going to live. And then when you get the thing, you're going to sabotage yourself because you're going to be like, I'm not worthy of this thing. So every day you have to remind yourself how worthy, how wonderful, and how enough you are. So that when you do get the thing, that programming is in there and it's just, you know, just tuning it up every so often. But that imposter syndrome, when I got into Big Mouth, which Big Mouth was a shit because now I'm writing. And it's the funniest fucking, I mean, this show is, you know, it's Nick Kroll, it's Maya Rudolph, it's Jordan P. I I mean, like, what? That's the funniest people in Hollywood. And I was like, what the fuck am I doing here? And so like the first, I would say, six months of the seven month job was me every night coming home, telling my husband, I think I got to quit. Telling my manager, I'm, this is enough. I don't, I don't think I can do this. So many times I almost quit. And I'm obviously very grateful I haven't. I'm on my third season there, but it was having to sit down and really reprogram. It was having to sit down every day and be like, okay, well, I did make one joke today. All right, look at you, <laughs> you know, like having to treat yourself and like take care of yourself. I had a, a, a mentor who once said, if you were your own parent, what advice would you give to yourself? And I think that's really important that we have to sometimes reparent ourselves in these moments. And so would my mother be like, boy, you do suck, get out of here. Or would she be like, I know this is hard, but know that you're enough. She would do that. So that's what I got to do for me. And that's what we have to do for ourselves to kind of uh, dissipate the imposter syndrome, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, and what I've heard from everyone too, is this idea of following what your internal guidance is, because you were talking about that from the beginning, about deciding whether or not to do this. And then, of course, what ends up becoming the challenge so often is continuing on. You get mm. success, something happens, it's an affirmation of your of the abilities that you have, and then moving forward with that. So it it I I love the the turn that this and, and the ideas that have been presented here today, because I feel as though what has happened is hearing from everybody just to open up your life and to not be so focused so much on the results of everything having to be a certain way at a certain time. And I'll tell you one thing, this having this conversation happen today during what we are experiencing, you know, in the world, as, as far as the lockdown, et cetera, has, um, I'm sure will be very inspiring to so many, even once um, we are through this time. So anyone else want to quickly, um, uh, address the question about imposter syndrome, and then we're going to wind things up. Well, I love, I love reparenting. I got this one, uh, repartnering. So, mm. <laughs> oh yeah. How to be a good partner to yourself, because as performers, we are our own, we are the instrument. So mm. we don't need a coach in the sense that we need someone to do something through us. It's us, right? So I saw this on this little Canadian morning show called City Line. You can be inspired anywhere. It's how you take things <laughs> in. Um, and this woman talked about how to become your own best friend. And mm -hmm. I think, again, like everything, the whole theme of this is it's, it's here. But like when you are having a moment with something new because that's usually when the imposter syndrome comes up there's a, a change in circumstance whether it's the the audience the the venue or who you are in in whatever it is you're doing it's usually your reaction to change and it's this question of am i capable and who am I? Who do I think I am? Right? Because that's the question, imposter. Who do I think I am? And I ask, who do I think I am not? Because that's the kind of best friend I am. I would be like, bitch, who are you not to? Show out on them people. Stand yes. out and be you. And so the mirror work that I do is in direct response to my imposter syndrome, which I now have gratitude for. Because if I didn't struggle with imposter syndrome, I wouldn't have all of these tools now to deal with life's things that are almost certain to happen. So mm. I look at everything with this radical acceptance view. It's, it's bad, okay, but what's great? 
What's great? Mm -hmm. Oh, I get to learn new tools. Thank you, imposter syndrome. That's what <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> I love it. Well, I want to say on that note, I want to thank you all, Rebecca, Ronan, Tyler, Shalita, Brandon, for being here today, for bringing uh, who you are and, and your journey and sharing that with us today, because it's very impactful, very powerful, and re it, the resilience that you're all talking about and showing in your own lives as artists um, just so beautiful and so inspiring. So thank you. Uh, and I want to say on behalf of the foundation, I want to thank you for sharing your process and your craft for the audience of actors.